All right, continuing our spot illustration. The last thing we did was choose local flat colors. But in coming back to these, I think they're fine local flat colors, but there's nothing about them that says the campus mascot that doesn't have really the campus colors. So I do have green and blue. They're not heightened. So I'm going to do a second draft on those flat colors. This is assignment five we're still working on. And so I open up my PSD in Photoshop, and that's what I had stolen from these kind of images. But then I just brought in our campus logo. <laughs> and if I'm going to do a mascot kind of image, even though it's of this, this weird wind-up toy, it makes sense to use the exact hex colors of the, the campus logo. So this is what I came up with. So you still have all the same features, right? But all I did was swap those colors for these that I found. So how do you do that? Well, again, I just duplicated my local flat color, and then I used the paint bucket in Photoshop. And then I used Option. I hold down Option, and I can select colors from these images that I've brought into Photoshop. So if I steal this exact green, it populates my foreground color square, and then I can just drop it in. And then this exact blue, I can just drop it in and recolor whatever I think it needs. So everything got moved around just a little bit. What's nice is now that I have two layers of local flat color, right? Only one of them can really be the local flat color, but I can blend them. I can use opacity and I can blend one on the other. And I kind of like that so that it's not so fluorescent. And then what I can do is merge those two together by going to layer merge layers. And now I have my local flat color. So what are the steps? I'm going to move this into my inspiration. Since we had Monday off, it's been a while. So the steps for digital coloring first, you set up a file in Photoshop that's a large enough resolution for your final poster. And that's going to be 16 by 20 inches at 350 pixels per inch. That will allow you to print to the highest quality that our printers allow to the, the largest size that our printers allow. Because this might be a good one to submit for the, the student show, which we also need to get printed and submitted by next week so because the submission deadline is april 11th and our next class is in class is april 10th everything goes fast we're sprinting to the end now so i have that white background then i drag and drop my line art in and the best possible line art is an eps file you know out of adobe illustrator when you bring that in it comes in as a smart object. So I label that black line art smart object as black bread and I lock it and I label the white background layer that's 16 by 20 filled in with white pixels. It's a background layer. I rename it white bread and I lock that and now we have our digital coloring sandwich. You only need one thing for a digital coloring sandwich. You Just like any sandwich, you can't just have two slices of bread. So I say you need cheese for like grilled cheese. That is your flat color. Now your flat color, this was the local flat color I chose. So that is a perfectly acceptable finished coloring solution. And what's so nice about that is because it's cheese on its own, like this is the slice of Velveeta on its own. This is on the white bread so I can see it a little bit better. That helps me see these colors really clearly. So if I wanna make little changes, I just go to that layer. These are the, the inside the sandwich are the only layers that should be unlocked. And I can hold down option and steal a color and then paint it in. And I kind of like those variations. Nope, that's too, too subtle. All right, so when you add them all together, you get this. 
Now, if I'm finished, and this is my finished coloring solution, what I'm going to do is turn off the white bread so it's free floating. That's important to do so you make sure that you don't have any like empty spaces in here. Because remember, even if you have white in your illustration, you need to fill that in with a color, even if that color is white. It's helpful to also have a gray background to kind of check that. And you want your finished color to look good on white and on gray and even on black. Because this, you'll have the option of putting this on t-shirts, on mugs, and it looks pretty good on black. But what's the problem with black is that the line art kind of disappears, right? So how could I fix that? Well, what I could do is go to my local flat color, double click it, and put a stroke on it, right? And that helps to offset. I can also do it with a glow. I can do it, you know, with all these different features. I can also go to my black bread layer, duplicate it. Actually, this is kind of a nice trick. Duplicate my local flat color, put those two together and merge them together. And then use layer styles on that merged layer, which is a copy. Do a color overlay, fill that color overlay with white right? Because this is how things get printed onto products. You usually do a base coat. Then you move that base coat. Think of this like mayonnaise being spread on the bottom slice of bread. You move it to the bottom. It doesn't change anything except that when I add additional effects like a stroke to the base coat and I do it on the outside, right? it will give me an offset between my illustrations line art and any background I want. So I can use a stroke like that. Try to get some interesting basic shapes. That works pretty well. I can also do things like a soft edged offset, an outer glow that grows beyond the stroke. Let's make it more opaque. Let's make it white. Let's make it noisier. Let's make it softer. And then those effects on your base coat can be turned on and off. Right. So I'm going to call that base coat, bless you, and offset. Those are helpful. So how would I finish this off now? I would turn off all the background layers. I'd save my progress as a PSD, but then I'd also save a copy as a PNG format because that's the free floating kind of sticker format that I'm going to put into Canvas. All right, and then if I go to Canvas and I post it, I'm saying that my best coloring solution now is just flat color, you know, flat local color. But remember, for that to work, you need to pick the right colors. And that can take some trial and error. And often it has to do with a lot of chromatic grays. But it brings us to our next step. So if these were my first draft, this is my final draft of local flat color. And I like those more. Don't move on from local flat color until you're happy with it, until it's passable, until it's something you would submit to a client, right, as an option. But then we have additional options. So if we go up in the assignment, you'll see my exhaustive explanation slides, right? So what's next? What's a digital coloring technique beyond flat color? Well, the next is duotone, which we talked about last class a little bit. And after your local flat color, then you can split that into lights and darks. This is called hard edge duotone. In animation, it's called cell shading. It's the same thing. So how do we do that? It's something you can all experiment with, even if you decide not to do it. So what do I do? 
First of all, I lock my base coat and I lock my local flat color. Now every layer is locked. I'll turn my white bread back on or maybe my gray bread on the bottom. And what I'll do is I'll make a duplicate of my cheese layer of my local flat color. Now with that duplicate, I'm going to rename it Duotone Highlights. Because when you do a tone something, it means you're taking your local color and you're pushing it both lighter and darker. So Duotone Highlights, how do I make that darker or brighter? I go to Image Adjustments and Levels, just like we did when we were compositing. And then I take that mid-tone slider and I push it towards the left, maybe about halfway. So now I have highlights. I basically just added white to every color. Next, if this is going to be cut edge, what I'm going to do is take my lasso with just a one pixel feather, almost no feather at all. And what I'm going to do is cut out where I think the shadows should be. So where would shadows be? Well, shadows will be in the mouth, right? Maybe something like this. And then hit delete. And what I get is duotone cut edge on those colors. Next, where else might I have a shadow? Well, probably under this visor and maybe cast onto the eyes. And you can always just lasso in between your line art. And then I hit delete. And now I have a duotone cut shadow under the visor. Next, that visor continues to here and then maybe along the jawline here. There we go. Now duotone can get cut edge can get pretty subtle and can also get really fussy. So if I have just a little sliver showing like that, I'm just going to delete it all the way. Then what if I want this metal to look a little bit more reflective? Well, I can cut out kind of bands of shadow. from these parts, even if it's subtle at this point, because right now all we have is local color and then a lighter version of local color. Same thing with the little turn key here. Just cutting out some of the shadows within the color. Sometimes in the line art itself, you have areas of shading that you then want to back up with your color. Like on this wing here. On the underbelly here. So basically anything that's not catching light. Right? And you can see this is different than using that 
paint bucket tool because you're dividing 